Okay, now we're good to go. Yeah, just any time. Uh, all right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Alberto Vargas. I'm the Associate Director of NASIS. Uh, and it's uh, uh, my pleasure to welcome you to uh, another of our, our lecture series. Uh, uh, Professor Lee Neifer is going to, from the Department of History, uh, History of Science. Uh, she's gonna introduce our speaker today. Mm -hmm. Wait, do you have any other announcements? Uh, well, we have, uh, we have yeah, the, the, there is our lecture next uh, Tuesday, um, uh, with Professor Glauco, uh, Arbix. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's gonna be at the, at the same time on Zoom. On so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, so I'm Lynn Neihart. I'm um, from the history department and um, one of the three co organizers of our uh, Brown Bag and Colloquium series. And, um, and so I first of all want to thank the Lapis program for um, being willing to co uh, sponsor this talk and um, have uh, wonderful space in this work. It just when we needed it, which is today. And um, so that we could have uh, Megan Maybe here for this talk. Um, Megan is uh, now associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Texas at Austin. And, um, but uh, we knew her then. <laughs> <laughs> she received her PhD from the History of Science then Department at um, here. Uh, in, 20, in in uh, uh, 2012, and in the past decade, she has been busy. Um, one of the things that she did was to write her first book um, called "American Topics: The Caribbean Roots of Diversity Science," published by University of North Carolina Press in 2017, which um, Shortly thereafter, won the Phil J. Pauley Prize of the History of Science Society for um, uh, the best book uh, in the history of science. I think they have changed it by then to in the Americas, um, which is a kind of perfect for this book. She has written uh, also uh, seven peer reviewed articles and two invited chapters. and. Uh, one of those articles also won a prize, the prize for best article in ISIS in the KGS three years. ISIS is the, uh, not that other ISIS, <laughs> it's the one that is the Journal of the History of Science Society. Um, so uh, uh, she's been making us proud for a long time. And she is um, now working on a project on the life and work of biologist and environmental writer, Marston Bates. The book is currently titled Being Natural, an Environmental Biography of Marston Bates. And it charts in here, I'm, I'm uh, quoting her uh, briefly, uh, a path through a succession of attempts by US actors to exert control over environments and people in the developing world through the 20th century, as well as examining an array of the treatment of such projects. So Bates worked in a lot of different settings between the 20s and the 40s, uh, including the United Fruit Company and the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and then he moved to the University of Michigan and turned to writing on nature and science for general readers. Um, and so as a public intellectual, he also became important in presenting a critical vision of what today would be called sustainable development. Uh, so the talk I'm even is given today uh, originate from background research uh, for this book, but it's a kind of a same thing. And uh, a longer version is scheduled to appear in uh, this is, right, is it next summer. Yes. Yes, yes in um, agricultural history. Uh, so today's talk is called Diversity for Monoculture, the United Fruit Company, and Agricultural Research. So welcome here. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's been um, just great to 
be here to, I haven't been back to Madison for, for five years, I guess. And it's wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, it's wonderful to see some familiar faces, some very familiar faces <laughs> and um, some new folks too. And I'm happy to chat with people after the talk too. Love to meet new folks uh, while I'm visiting an old familiar place. Um, so uh, let, me, let me just go ahead and get started. <clears throat> um, first, let's start by considering two neighboring but starkly differing landscapes in early 20th century Honduras. On one hand, the vast banana monocultures of the valley surrounding the Caribbean port of Tela, um, and on the other, the in the city's upland outskirts, uh, the site of the Lancetia Experiment Station, which was a laboratory and botanical garden where one of the world's most diverse living collections of tropical fruits could be found. The first of these two landscapes, I'd say, epitomizes agriculture at an industrial scale. You can see uniform straight rows of a single variety of banana, the Gros Michel, and they stretch almost as far as the eye can see. Um, apart from the topography there, you might mistake it for an Iowan cornfield. Um, it's a standardized landscape, one dependent on a variety of things and people that are not visible in the photograph itself. Now, among them, a massive labor force and a technical infrastructure increasingly in the decades after this photo was taken, that infrastructure um, would include pesticides and the chemical knowledge to create and apply them. Returning to the second image, the second landscape, I'd say, appears quite differently, although it's just situated about three miles up the Lancetia Valley to the south of the first photograph. Um, in the foreground, there's something of a pastoral theme. There's outbuildings, gardens, trial plots. These are all part of the experimental station. At the time the photo was taken, there were dozens of varieties, not only of bananas, but pineapples, avocados, mangoes, citrus, lychee, ackee, durians, mangosteens, and other fruit um, growing on the station grounds, not to mention lots of different kinds of vegetables, cover crops, and timber species that were being experimented with. In total, the station, at that time cultivated more than 400 species and varieties of economic plants from around the world. Where monotonous fields dominate that first image, here the forested hills beyond the station loom large. The hills are forested for the most part, um, and although labeled at the bottom here, you can see practically primeval forest, you might be able to discern some subsistence clearings or areas of second growth um, if you had a larger scene or could zoom in. Um, on the whole, this second photo presents a much more varied natural and agricultural landscape. But like the first photo, it too is a landscape deeply connected to modern science. In this case, depending on the local and cosmopolitan knowledge of horticulturalists, botanists, entomologists, agronomists, and farmers from Latin America, United States, and Europe. Seemingly paradoxically, both of these landscapes were creations of the United Fruit Company. One is the iconic banana monoculture closely associated with this infamous, infamous company, reliant on vast land holdings, disciplined workers, and the intensification of chemical inputs to produce a commodity crop destined for faraway markets. The other is a lesser known corporate research station where, uh, as we'll see, United Fruit experimented with a wide variety of alternative crops and alternative cultivation methods under the banner of agricultural diversification. So given its well-known and nearly single-minded focus on bananas, why would the United Fruit Company fund an experiment station tasked with exploring the diversity of the world's tropical crops? What's the connection between these two uh, landscapes with their seemingly contrary orientations towards plant diversity, land use, uh, and scientific knowledge? So my talk today, examines the history of the Lancetia Experiment Station to explore the company's sponsorship of science and the multiple shifting meanings of diversification in 20th century agribusiness. <clears throat> United Fruit Company's sponsorship of agricultural research, I think deserves um, closer attention from historians. Um, understandably, most of the vast scholarly literature about the company focuses on its checkered 
uh, political, labor, and business history. Um, it's far more famous for sponsoring dictatorships than it is for sponsoring science. Um, and the company earned its reputation as El Pulpo, the octopus, with its influence stretching over neo-colonial enclaves and quote unquote banana republics throughout the Circum-Caribbean through the 20th century. For contemporary critics, as well as later dependency theorists and historians of US foreign policy, United Fruit has stood as a case study of economic imperialism. Since the 1990s, cultural and labor historians have illuminated the complex social worlds of the company's West Indian, Latin American, and North American workers, while also kind of chipping away at the image of the company as a monolithic force in the region. These authors have shown that United Fruit's power didn't go uncontested, and that in fact, the company was forced to respond and adapt to changing political conditions on the ground in the range of countries where it operated. At the same time, in recent years, a small but crucial literature on the ecological dimensions of United Fruits banana lands has also emerged. Um, this builds on the existing labor and cultural histories and is also part of a rapidly expanding field of Latin American and Caribbean environmental history. So John Saluri, Steve Marquardt, and Richard Tucker have demonstrated the dire consequences for the environment of banana monocultures, including deforestation, the emergence of plant diseases like Sigatoka and Panama disease, and uh, how the pesticides used to control these diseases harm the health of plantation workers. Mm -hmm. These environmental histories also begin to suggest that the company's ability to control so much of the land and economy of Central America and Caribbean depended not only on covert operations, market manipulations, the repression of organized labor, but also on agricultural science. While scholarly interest in the history of corporate science, I would say, is, is growing, <laughs> United Fruit's institutional support for scientific research has really been approached only glancingly. The company's scientific activities were, in fact, pretty wide ranging. Um, they were long standing, and I'd say they were significant in their effects. It first began formal studies of Panama disease in 1903. Um, and founded a research laboratory in Costa Rica as early as 1914. And by the 1920s, um, multiple departments of the company were directed, um, were directly involved in not only agricultural research, but also in other areas like technology and medicine. Um, United Fruits Engineering Department and Radio Department each played outsized roles in transforming the region's uh, transportation and communication infrastructure. And the company's medical department, you know, was famed for its hospitals as well as its in investigations into the diseases that were confronted by uh, its large personnel living and working in tropical environments. So the company and its employees also, in a variety of formal and informal ways, engaged in botany, zoology, ecology, and archaeology, um, either on their own or, or in some ways sponsored by the company. <clears throat> By 1927, as you can see in this organizational diagram, United Fruit also had inaugurated a full bone research department. Most of the work um, done in this department did focus on bananas. Um, nutrition, shipping, banana ripening, breeding, um, banana diseases and their chemical control. At the Lancetia Experiment Station in Honduras, as we'll see, though the research department's activities broadened to encompass research on agricultural diversification beyond bananas. Indeed, the station's research program stood in some tension with the dominant focus on Gromichel bananas, emphasizing as it did the horticultural development of alternative crops and cultivation techniques to adapt new crops to local conditions. Now, over time, the company's budget and enthusiasm for uh, research like this fluctuated dramatically over the decades. But you know, by 1960, it was spending more than $3 million a year on scientific investigations. So I'd say that in the sheer kind of scale and scope of this work, the United Fruit Company should be recognized um, and looked at more closely as a significant scientific actor within the 20th century circum Caribbean. This is a fact with important ramifications for the global history of agribusiness. After all, United Fruit 
was among the first modern multinational corporation. Um, in Philip Borges' words, it was, quote, the quintessential model for the institutional form of the multinational corporation that changed the face of the world during the 20th century. So understanding United Fruit's changing, complex, and sometimes contradictory orientation towards scientific research is therefore vital, I'd say, for a full understanding of the global history of science and agribusiness. This field um, has greatly developed since Deborah Fitzgerald called on historians of agriculture, science, and technology to attend more closely to corporations. Um, as she put it, corporations had a crucial role in the early industrialization of agriculture, which was unparalleled by either the federal government or the land grant system that historians uh, of US agriculture had so far focused on. And in her words, thus well, cry, cries out for scholarly attention. A lot more has been done since then, yet it remains as Fitzgerald noted 30 years ago, quote, notoriously difficult to study the history of existing companies. United Fruit's successor, Chiquita, has not made the company's central archives accessible. So historians have largely had to rely on its published annual reports and employee newsletter, Fruitco, on some photograph collections and oral histories with former employees, as well as documents that have been made public through lawsuits or serendipitous fines. Um, now, I use for this paper some of those things, but also um, a, a set of sources that I think is a bit underutilized in thinking about the history of United Fruit. And that is the personal papers of researchers who worked for the company. Um, these are of particular interest, I think, to historians of agricultural science. <clears throat> because of the interpenetration of corporate scientific networks with those of the academy, government agencies, and philanthropic organizations, um, and the frequently, frequency with which um, key figures move between these private and public sectors. This means that the papers of many researchers who were at one time employed by or affiliated with United Fruit have in fact been preserved in a variety of university and federal archives. <clears throat> um, among these are the papers of the founder and first director of United Fruit's Lancetia Experiment Station, Wilson Papineau, um, as well as the entomologist Marston Bates, who my second project is about. Um, he worked for Papineau uh, during 1928 to 1931. Um, and also the botanist Paul Hamilton Allen, who directed Lancetia uh, between 1953 and 63, as well as others who worked at the station between its establishment in 1925 and 1974, when the company turned the station over to the Republic of Honduras for management by its Secretary of Natural Resources. Now, these, um, these papers of scientists, um, they have limitations. They can't provide a complete picture of the internal workings of the research department or even the administration of the Lancetia Experiment Station. Um, <clears throat> I don't have the full institutional records, right? But in tandem with published records, they reveal uh, tensions within the company over the purpose of research, as well as the meaning and value of agricultural diversification. And I think, in addition, importantly, they demonstrate that the countryside of Honduras was not simply a space of economic extraction, but also a place of knowledge production and experimentation with multiple ways of knowing and using land and biodiversity. So with all that in mind, let's turn um, finally to Lancetia. <clears throat> so in 1925, Wilson Papineau chose 40 acres, it's about 16 hectares, in the Lancetia Valley of Honduras for the location of United Fruit's new experiment station. United Fruit had acquired the farm at Lancetia as part of a much larger concession of about 162,000 hectares from its subsidiary, or, sorry, to its subsidiary, the Taylor Railroad Company. <clears throat> Here's a map from the time. Um, it was about three miles from the town of Tela on the Caribbean coast. Um, this tract had previously been owned by the Atlantic Fruit Company, which was recently put out of business by United Fruit as it expanded in the area. Bananas and coconuts had been planted there, but due to the spread of Panama disease and coconut red ring disease, the site wasn't really commercially viable anymore. United Fruit's sponsorship of science more broadly was um, similarly driven by its changing policies of land use and land acquisition. As Steve Marquardt has shown, 
It initially depended on experienced West Indian workers for their existing knowledge of banana cultivation. Although it funded a handful of soil scientists and chemists from the company's founding in 1899 through the 1910s, United Fruit had, in its early days, comparatively little need for formal scientific expertise. Instead, it relied on the tacit and embodied knowledge of its labor force. In the face of local soil depletion or the emergence of banana diseases, scientific knowledge wasn't really <clears throat> essential. It could simply acquire new lands and move on, acting, uh, in Steve Marquardt's words, uh, quote, like, like a Sweden cultivator on a known, an enormous scale. This approach led the company to become notoriously one of the region's largest landowners. By 1930, it would own or lease 1.4 million hectares. This strategy had already become problematic by the 1920s. On one hand, there was an escalating problem of managing lands made useful by useless, sorry, useless by banana diseases. And on the other hand, the company could not afford to ignore the growing political outcry against land grabbing. Um, that it faced in the republics of Central America. <clears throat> in this co context, the company turned to a new strategy, sponsoring scientific research. Scientific research could help them do more with the lands it already owned. Faced with large land holdings that disease made useless for growing bananas, the company sought alternative crops to make the lands profitable again. While they researched chemical, chemical control methods for banana diseases in laboratories, in Boston and in Central America, they also hedged their bets by sponsoring um, an, a different line of research, horticultural research on potential new crops. So you can think of diversification in this sense for the company as something of a backup plan. <clears throat> Papano seemed to be a perfect fit for this project. When United Fruit hired him, he was already well known in scientific circles for his work with the USDA Office of Foreign Seed and Plant Introduction in the 1910s and 20s. He was a protege of the famed plant explorer, David Fairchild, and Papano had traveled throughout rural Guatemala in search of locally cultivated varieties of avocado that might pro um, prove uh, economically viable for growers in California and Florida. You can thank whatever avocado you ate recently in the United States uh, to, to Fairchild and Papano. Um, uh, and, and he was also a part of many other kinds of bio, bio prospecting event, ventures, essentially, throughout Central America. <clears throat> now, in 1920, Papano was approached by United Fruits Vice President, uh, Victor Cutter. <clears throat> Cutter was a vocal advocate for scientific research and for, uh, for self-described progressive business practices within the company. Papano recalled meeting with Cutter and being told, uh, quote, to come see him when I was tired of working for the US government. Five years later, after Cutter rose to become the company's new president, Papano took him up on the offer. Quote, I went to Honduras and found things quite attractive there. Uh, who told this to uh, Mrs. Fairchild. Corporate science was appealing to Papano. Ultimately, he took the new job, not only because the company offered him a much higher salary than the USDA did, uh, initially, he got $6,000 a year, plus a house, furniture, and two servants. Um, but also, it offered him escape from what was becoming an increasingly bureaucratic atmosphere at the USDA. Um, he found himself there mostly tired, tied to a desk, and he wanted to be outside doing um, field work. <clears throat> and um, the company also promised that he could shape his own research program. Um, this offered him something more challenging and rewarding than he found in the government work. Quote, they say I'm to have a free hand and will make my own job, he explained. In 1925, he and his wife, Dorothy Hughes Papineau, who herself was a botanist at the USDA and at Britain's Kew Gardens before that, together they moved their household to Taylor. Papineau was given the title Superintendent of Agricultural Experiments, and he had the pick of company lands, at least those no longer commercially viable for bananas, in choosing a site. Uh, to place a station. Um, at Lancetia, he found a range of soil conditions, access to water during dry periods, yet no danger of flooding during the wet season, and, and there was also access to the port of Pela, where he would need that access, right, in order to receive and distribute uh, plants uh, for propagation at the station. Papano requested 
um, with a fairly modest budget uh, for the station of $10,000 um, to start it up. Uh, and he started with, um, as you can see here, um, some fairly unostentatious buildings, an office, a nursery, plant sheds, and shade buildings. <clears throat> the company supported Papineau in assembling a cosmopolitan group of assistants, quote, drawn from the four quarters of the world, of the globe. <clears throat> Through his connections with USDA and Q, as well as his extensive Latin American travels, um, he brought together uh, a group to work with him. Among the earliest employees at the station were the British horticulturalist Alfred Butler, who would go on to become the company's chief agronomist, as well as uh, Jorge Benitez, who was an Ecuadorian horticulturalist that Papano met during his days hunting avocado varieties, and um, Frederick Coville, who was the son of a USDA botanist um, of the same name. Papano and his team um, began uh, by building an enormous collection of fruit trees and other economic plants from around the world. What would become, um, according to them anyway, the most extensive collection of economic plants in tropical America. Uh, the station ultimately expanded to a thousand acres, that's 405 hectares. <clears throat> in 1926, they set to work with two main research goals. First, to determine what new crops to be introduced on worn out banana lands, and second, to develop improved cultivation practices that would make these crops viable over the long term. Now, Papineau brought more to the United Fruit Company than just his expertise with economic plants. He also brought, I'd argue, a particular orientation toward research on the land, a perspective that was clearly shaped by his time with the USDA. So in this way, I think the history of Lancetia reveals some important avenues of cross-fertilization between corporate and government science. And it also demonstrates the importance of paying attention to corporate scientists' affiliations with broader scientific networks and values. And for Papineau, foremost among these was the ideal of the agricultural experiment station. This is an institutional form, pioneered in Germany, advanced in the USDA, uh, advanced by the USDA in the United States after the 1887 Hatch Act. By the time the Lancetia station was inaugurated in 1926, experiment stations were certainly nothing new in Latin America. The first state-sponsored agricultural experiment station in the region was founded in Brazil as early as 1885, and it was headed by experts trained within the German experiment station system. By the early 20th century, most Latin American national governments had formed agricultural departments and were undertaking some sort of experimental uh, work. So um, many of these state-sponsored experiment stations were, were short-lived. Um, they sometimes fall, fell victim to the shifting winds of political change or to financial woes. As Stuart McCook has um, stated, uh, quote, agricultural experiment stations were frequently used as political footballs in conflicts between planters and governments. Alongside these nationally sponsored stations stood a variety of colonial institutions. The British network of colonial botanical gardens of the 18th and 19th centuries, of course, formed a significant antecedent to these new agricultural experiment stations in the Caribbean, um, although those that remained by the 20th century faced ever tightening budgets. Spain had also established two agricultural stations in Puerto Rico. And after 1898, the USDA began to extend its insular experiment stations there, as well as in the US colonies of Guam and Hawaii in the Pacific. In Cuba, Cuban and US sugar growers found their own, founded their own private research stations and laboratories that others have written about. Um, um, for the most part, all of these stations though, tended to focus on, um, developing chemical fertilizers or combating the pests and diseases of a few dominant commodity crops. So in this way, they differed, I would argue, quite substantially from the very broad project of crop diversification and agricultural extension that Papineau proclaimed for his company station. Most of United Fruit's banana research took place not at the Lancetia station, but in laboratories at Lima and in Boston. Papineau did oversee the collection of banana varieties and some uh, experimentation with uh, banana cultivation techniques like using cover crops. 
But this took place mainly on um, temporary field trials uh, outside of Lancetia on, on working banana plantation. And banana research was really only one small part of Station's work. Um, as Papano put it, quote, the other side of our work the introdu um, was the introdu introduction and dissemination of crop plants hitherto not cultivated in Central America and improved varieties of those which are already known there, but which exist uh, in primitive or seedling form. Papano received extensive collections of Southeast Asian fruit species and varieties from uh, in 1927, for example, from Otto A. Reinpain's um, collections in Southeast Asia. Uh, he was a United Fruit researcher who was, who was traveling mainly in search of banana varieties, but also brought other things to Papano. Lancetia was also linked into global botanical networks um, that included not only the USDA, but also colonial gardens throughout the world. And perhaps this is surprising given the intense secrecy that the company is known for that it enforced around its later research efforts. But during the 1920s through 40s, Lancetia really exchanged uh, plant material quite freely um, with botanical gardens, stations, and farms all around the world, and especially in Dutch Java, Belgian Congo, and throughout British India and Africa. The station um, uh, also <laughs> uh, distributed the plants it propagated, not just to its own tropical divisions, but also to independent growers locally and regionally. And this reportedly amounted to the dispersal of, quote, literally millions of seeds, cuttings, and grafted trees. At the same time, Lancetia was not simply a botanical or introduction garden. It was also the site of active experimentation with plant breeding, crop rotation, soil fertility, the management of plant diseases through a range of cultivation techniques, not just uh, through pesticides. So in other words, Lancetia operated in many ways far more like agricultural experiment station and it, agricultural experiment stations in the US than even those insular USDA stations in Puerto Rico and Hawaii. USDA scientists um, in those locations, um, others have shown, you know, soon gave up their initial plans to diversify local agriculture, right? They'd gone in in an effort to reduce reliance on food imports, to ameliorate the risks of a one-crop economy, but under pressure from pow powerful sugar planters, they ultimately reduced their focus to serving the sugar export economy. Papano, working within United Fruit, ironically, seems to have had more freedom to pursue research in crop diversification. Indeed, philosophically, he remained much in line with the agrarian ideals of the USDA experiment station, whose purpose was extending scientific agriculture to the public. Their work was ostensibly a democratic project aimed to serve and uplift yeoman farmers. Papano likewise envisioned Lancetia's efforts as a democratizing project of agricultural extension in Latin America. But the station aimed, he claimed, not simply at increasing corporate profits, but at no less than, quote, the future prosperity of Central America. <clears throat> Papano framed the station's work as more than simply to identify alternative crops for United Fruit Disputed Banana Lands. In his view, diversification research equally serve the interests of Honduras and all of Central America. In an article published both in United Fruits Employee Magazine and in Spanish in the Bulletin of the Pan American Union, Papano argued, for example, quote, no country whose prosperity depends upon a single crop, even upon two or three crops can afford to rest content. The only solid agricultural prosperity is one built upon diversification. Not alone should we have numerous tropical crops for export, but also food products adequate to make the country independent and self-supporting. <coughs> now, this is a much more expansive vision of the purpose of the company's crop diversification crop program and quite a, a different vision of land use than one usually associates with United Fruit. Rather than simply diversifying United Fruit's business portfolio, Papano claimed Lancetia could assist in diversifying Honduras's national economy and even Honduran's diets. Certainly, such statements, and including the company's sponsorship of science itself, serve rhetorical purposes in the company's public relations effort. By providing positive publicity to the increasingly controversial company, Papano's work at Lancetia helped to counter negative images of United Fruit that were beginning to appear. 
Charles David Kepner's prominent critical expose, for example, charged the company with being with a, an exploitative economic imperialism that merely reaped the fruits of fertile tropical lands rather than investing in long long term lasting local progress. Still, even Kepner, um, in his work, portrayed research efforts at Lancetia in in a fairly positive light. Um, and perhaps in that he was influenced by his interviews with company entomologist Marston Bates, who did his best to present a favorable, favorable view of his employer's role in agricultural improvement. <clears throat> Even as its funding waxed and waned, research at Lancetia would continue to serve this role and company uh, publicity into the 1950s. But I'd say that at the same time, Papineau's rhetoric shouldn't be glossed as solely part of a PR campaign. By emphasizing Lancetia's diversification research as, quote, improving the land and arguing that his program was developing scientific methods of land use for the greater good, not just for the company's profit, Papineau was also participating in a growing discourse of Pan-Americanism among scientists, uh, politicians, and business leaders at the time. So here he writes, the United Fruit Company has faith in the future of Central America and is willing to invest its money in projects which will make for the ultimate upbuilding of the Central American countries, Lancetia is the Lancetia experiment station is an evidence of this faith. Such rhetoric not only served to deflect accusations of economic imperialism, it also tapped into a broader Pan American movement, one that anticipated and influenced the Good Neighbor policy, which would be announced by President Roosevelt in 1933. And Papineau's uh, Pan Americanist ideals took a concrete form not only in Lancetia's research program, but also in 1941, uh, when he worked with uh, United Fruits President Samuel Zamuri to found the Escuela Agricola Panamericana, which today continues as the Universidad Zamorano. It's a kind of corporate <laughs> version of a land grant college. United Fruits philanthropic arm donated money and land near to Butigalpa, Honduras to establish a school. And indeed, Papano envisioned the school as, quote, another Lancetia on a glorified scale. Its purpose, he explained, was to educate independent farmers across Latin America and, quote, conduct experiments with a view toward the diversification of tropical American agriculture. In doing so, the school would project a new image of United Fruit as a socially responsible corporation, a cooperative partner with United with uh, Central America's development. <clears throat> now, Papineau's views on research and Pan-Americanism did not necessarily find universal support within the company. <clears throat> Indeed, his appeal to the company's faith in research for Central American development should be understood, I think, as much as an internal plea to managers within the company as an effort at external publicity. Um, although President Cutter saw the value of research, even noting it, uh, even highlighting it in his 1928 annual report, um, the importance of fundamental knowledge for our many different operations, both for present economies and future problems. Um, but such a long-term perspective wasn't common at all levels of management. Papineau frequently ran into skepticism about the utility of Lancetia's diverse uh, collections. And he liked to recall, uh, he told many times in his letters, the story, quote, the time one of our managers came to the station and looking at a plant asked, what's this? Can you sell it? Can you eat it? No? Then what the hell is it here for? Um, Lancetia's diversification research cut against the grain of the company's status quo, which was banana monoculture. <clears throat> and in uh, Unifruco, uh, there were regularly featured articles that were intended to educate employees about the activities and value of the company's research department. Uh, it was kind of an effort to overcome internal resistance to change. One piece conceded, quote, many people look upon research only as a means of proving that everything that has been done is wrong. That the real object of research is a constructive one. I don't know how well they did it convincing. <laughs> convincing. Um, but even with Cutter's support, Papineau faced a particularly uphill battle because horticultural research and experimentation necessarily looks to the long-term horizon, right? Um, <clears throat> it uh, carries financial risks. Its results can't be certain. Not every introduced plant could be viably cultivated. Fewer still would uh, pan out to become marketable. Only time could tell which of the many thousands of varieties 
uh, obscure plants uh, would ultimately prove their worth under some unknowable future market condition. And Papineau acknowledged that plant introduction, quote, <clears throat> is a field less promising from the standpoint of immediate results, but perhaps even most, more so in the long run, for it can hardly be assumed that the banana will continue to constitute the major crop, almost the only crop of real importance in a country the size of Honduras. There are vast acres of land not suitable for bananas. There must be other crops for these if they are to be developed, and developed they inevitably will become, he wrote. Papineau could not promise his company short-term profits from the research he did at Lancetia, but <clears throat> given his own strong belief in the economic and social logic of agricultural diversification, a view shaped both by his time at the USDA and by transnational currents of Pan-Americanism, <clears throat> Papineau believed that his experimental program would ultimately benefit both the company and Latin America. <clears throat> Now, decades later, in 1966, I'm jumping way forward in time, Papineau would reflect back on the work of the station, arguing that his long-term vision had indeed been vindicated. He believed the company's investment in diversification was finally beginning to pay off. <clears throat> but who saw the returns? What exactly had been diversified? The goal of diversification had held a range of shifting meanings since Lancetia's founding. For the company, it meant expanding its portfolio finding new crops to grow on lands where bananas couldn't, bringing new, new products to market, hedging its overall risks. Yet in Papineau's telling, diversification also seemed to mean broadening Honduras's export economy, reducing its dependence on a few commodities to foster lasting development. And at various points, arguments for the diversification program even seem to imply aiding, Hondur aiding the Honduran domestic economy and the health of its citizens by bringing more variety into the national diet. The apparently unifying label of diversification obscured some real tensions along these different goals. Now, certainly, as Papineau took pains to point out in the 60s, several of the company's collections of experimental crops were indeed found to be of sudden vital strategic importance to the United States during World War II as supply lines from Asia were cut off. From Lancetia and other experimental sites of the company, uh, that Papineau had fought, fought pretty hard to maintain during the Great Depression, the company was able to quickly disperse reserves of manila hemp, rubber, quinine. These were ramped up into large-scale production to meet the demands of the U.S. military during the war. And this was something that President Samuel Zamuri um, was happy to tout, even though he'd been the one to cut the, the budget of the, of the research department. Um, uh, Yet even as the company uh, pointed out its patriotism in supplying this uh, material to the, the, the army, it actually had little choice but to comply with the war effort, right? The US Navy requisitioned all of the United Fruits ships during the war, um, and uh, which severely curtailed its ability to do any kind of business. Um, and uh, the, the, war experience, uh, the war experience ultimately might have proved the industrial utility of Papineau's uh, experimental plants, but this didn't necessarily mean they turned any kind of profit for the company yet. So even if the company hadn't cashed in, in Papineau's words, yet on the economic potential of most of Lancetia's collections, um, Papineau believed he had one especially good example of the long-term utility of his diversification program. And this was the African oil palm, which he considered to be the station's most important contribution, both to United Fruit and to Honduras. With the commercial development of oil palm alone, he argued, the company had made back all the money it had ever invested in the experiment station. Several oil palm varieties were among the earliest group of introductions to the station. They were grown from seeds shipped by Rankin that had been collected at the Bautenzorg Botanical Garden in Java uh, and at the experiment station in Serdang, Malayan. Over subsequent years, the station accumulated more African and Asian varieties from David Fairchild, <clears throat> and through exchange with the USDA, uh, exchange with the Niala Experimental Farm in Sierra Leone, Niala, Botanical Gardens in the Belgian Congo, US Rubber Com Company and Sumatra and other sources. These amounted to at least 44 varieties of African palm oil or oil palm in the 1930s. Oil palm was a promising crop for former banana lands in part because it could tolerate high levels of copper found in soils that had been contaminated by years of spraying the Bordeaux mixture fungicide. 
And although it required substantial processing and refining, that is an industrial infrastructure, palm oil was a versatile uh, product with industrial applications as well as the potential to substitute for vegetable oil or lard. <clears throat> Focusing on breeding and cultivation methods that could increase oil quality and yield, the company expanded its palm research project into new experimental plots, for example, here at San Alejo in Honduras and later at sites in Costa Rica. Although palm oil remained a minor concern uh, in comparison to bananas for the company, oil palm was beginning to be established on a commercial footing within Central American markets by the 1940s, thanks largely to seed distributed from Lancetia. Now, <clears throat> oil palm seemed to fit squarely into Papano's multivalent vision of agricultural diversification, a vision that was captured in breathless prose by um, D.H. Radler, who was assistant to the director of the research department in uh, 1960. In this piece, intended for a bilingual visitor's uh, brochure for Lancetia, Radler prominently featured the station's role in developing palm oil as evidence of the station's enduring scientific value and the company's benevolent role in Central American development. And I can't help it, I'm going to uh, quote this one at length. Um, <clears throat> Lancetia introduced the African oil palm into Central America. Today, Honduras produces 4 million pounds of palm oil in a year. Costa Rica, 10 million. The nearly 10,000 acres devoted to palm oil production in the two countries was once useless jungle. Now they are richly productive, attractive farms dotted with the homes, schools, commissaries, and dispensaries of the hundreds of workers and their families who live there. Without this one imported tree, any of these people might have had no job, no income, no hope. Lancetia means more than just a palm. It means life. Any of its thousand varieties could, as oil palm did, explode into newfound productivity for the people of the American tropics. So Radler is presenting here, I would say, a highly exaggerated uh, portrait of a pastoral modernity. Palm oil was in fact not yet a major export crop for Honduras at the time he wrote this, nor would it ever bring such egalitarian prosperity. Radler, echoing Papineau and others in the research department, argued that Lancetia's research program is bringing, quote, new progress for science, new diversification for crop and tropical agriculture, new sources of work and income for tropical countries and their people. Yet even as they defended the scientific value of diverse horticultural research collections at Lancetia, these same scientists obscured and devalued other forms of natural and agricultural diversity that useless jungle, the rural landscapes that they deemed neither productive nor attractive. Their vision of a diversified modern agricultural economy elided also its appropriation of the agro-diversity agro of the rural world. Lancetia's many varieties, after all, ultimately had their origins in generations of smallholder cultivation and selection. If the so-called diversification program really meant only the identification of new monocultures for the company to exploit, then oil palm was indeed well positioned to serve as Lancetia's key success story. Even with the success from their point of view, in 1956, the company slashed Lancetia's budget, reducing it to cover bare maintenance of its existing plantings and structures. The fate of the station was tied to a swath of local labor and environmental upheavals, as well as to some broader economic and political trends that I'm going to um, give you a sense of rather rapidly. Uh, in 1954, hunter and fruit workers staged a massive um, and partially successful general strike for be better wages and conditions. That same year, with a hurricane and major uh, flood damage to plantations along the whole north coast of Honduras. And meanwhile, the company faced fallout from its notorious involvement in the overthrow of neighboring Guatemalan president and land reform advocate Jacobo Arbenz that same year. <clears throat> United Fruit was facing pressure, not only from reformers in Central America, but also from stockholders in the US Department of Justice, which filed a civil antitrust suit against the company. Banana production increasingly appeared to be a risky business. Profits were in decline. 1957 brought another hurricane to Northern Honduras and increasingly severe problems with Panama disease. And then in 1962, Honduras passed a major agrarian reform law that severely limited the leasing and ownership of large tracts of lands by foreign corporations. 
basically by the you know, country. The uncertainty surrounding the agrarian reform uh, not only put Lancetia in limbo, but the company's broader operations as well. In Honduras, and as Marcelo Buccelli has shown throughout the region, United Fruit uh, responded to these increasing pressures by shifting its business model. The company began to divest itself of its land holdings. Increasingly, it pulled out of direct involvement in production, ultimately transferring, transforming itself into a kind of marketing company and shifting the risks of banana production onto, onto growers. United Fruit continued to fund research at a range of other experimental sites, including new uh, banana variety research and breeding and uh, pesticide research and uh, more research into the oil palm and other new crops. But by 1965, managers had, quote, begun to look for a way of divesting itself of the operation of the garden at Lancetia, where, um, where several of those other projects had begun. <clears throat> but the company couldn't simply abandon the site. In 1964, in the wake of that agrarian reform law, um, the company had been compelled to sign a contract um, with Honduras's Instituto Nacional Agrario that had governed the terms of its ongoing operations in the country. And as part of that contract, the company was obliged to maintain Lancetia as a botanical garden for at least 25 years or else have the land expropriated. The company turned again to its scientific connections within the US government and within academia. This time, not for expertise in research, but rather with a proposition to lease Lancetia. If the company could lease the experiment station to say the University of California, or to the Smithsonian Institution, it could honor its contract with the Republic of Honduras while minimizing its financial responsibilities for the site. Um, as um, Smithsonian officials discussed the prospect to each other, they, uh, they explained it this way, quote, their reasons are partly altruistic and partly economic. There are probably tax advantages in supporting Lancetia through their foundation rather than directly. So uh, negotiations about this war on and the Organization for Tropical Studies did use the station at least once for a tropical botany course, but uh, this corporate academic collaboration never fully materialized, partly because of the uncertain land tenure future of the site. Finally, in 1974, the company now merged to form United Brands, uh, turned the Lancetia Experiment Station over to Honduras's Department of Natural Resources, where it was um, then managed by the National Forestry Sciences as you can see here. Lancetia's handover from United Fruit to Honduras took place as the company again faced uh, local pushback in the form of strikes and banana export taxes, hurricane damage, hurricane damage uh, and record financial losses and a bribery scandal on top of that. In the 1970s, the 1970s also saw the, the peak of Honduras's brief major uh, land reform, a process in which Lancetia's oil palms would resurface to play a surprising and deeply ambiguous role. My conclusion here, I promise. So today, Taylor's outskirts no longer abound in bananas. Once just a single experimental crop among hundreds grown at Lancetia, African oil palm plantations now fill the former banana lands of the surrounding countryside. Oil palm trees also tower along the roads that head toward the United Food Company's former experiment station, now a botanical garden. The legacies of this former site of corporate science have been profoundly mixed. Certain aspects of Papineau's long-term vision of diver diversification ultimately did unfold. Bananas were indeed unsustainable as Honduras's only major export crop. Oil palm did provide a means for the country to shift beyond bananas. Yet Lancetia never fostered a transition to a truly diversified economy or agricultural landscape. <clears throat> Growing over 160,000 hectares of oil palm, Honduras is today the seventh largest producer of palm oil in the world and the largest in Central America. The palm oil industry took off in Honduras beginning in the 1970s. Significantly, significantly however, this was not under the auspices of United Brands, then renamed Chiquita in 1989. Honduran officials made, palm, made oil palm their own. They latched onto the crop um, as a centerpiece of their efforts at land reform and modernization. These ambitious projects included the relocation of peasants, as other, others have written about, to cooperatives oriented toward large-scale palm oil production. 
By the 1990s, however, neoliberal policies and a backlash to the agrarian reforms left large local landowners and transnational corporations again in control. <clears throat> Environmentally, the industry has also had two phases. Some palm oil producers have achieved RSPO, that is Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil um, certification. Uh, they do this by, by growing palm on former banana lands rather than clearing more biodiverse native forests. They can market then an image of uh, ecological sustainability. At the same time, Honduran palm oil companies have been implicated in the murder of environmental activists who have fought their encroachment, including Taylor native Jeanette Powers. United Fruit is gone, but its legacies in the landscape are multiple. Oil palm has remained at the center of agrarian reform, counter reform, and land conflicts in Honduras. The station itself also remains. While oil palms are its most visible legacy in Honduras's broader landscape and economy, less visibly, there are many species and cultivars which have been distributed nearby. Um, residents and private orchards continue to pur purchase fruit trees um, from the station, from the, from the garden's nurseries. Um, people sell mangosteens and rambutans along the highway heading to the, heading to the garden. Lancetia is still among the largest botanical gardens in Latin America and the hemisphere's largest collection of Southeast Asian plants, despite the loss of some introduced species over time. Over, over time. It plays a, a role in the local tourist economy and the Lancetia garden, and thanks in part to Callis's work, the larger surrounding the biological reserve in green there, um, are also significant sites uh, of biodiversity conservation. They continue to be sites for scientific research, both on exotic and native species. And such research has often uh, taken place in conjunction with other major Honduran scientific institutions, including others historically born out of parts of the United Fruit Company's research department, such as Zamorano and uh, FHIA, the Fundacion Hondureña, the Investigacion Agricola, the successor of United Fruit's La Lima Laboratory. <clears throat> the complex legacies of Lancetia and United Fruits Research Department in Honduras demonstrate the need to take a closer look at the historical role of science in agribusiness, especially in Latin America. Latin America was a laboratory for new forms of global agribusiness during the 20th century, forms which fundamentally depended on the production of scientific and technical knowledge. Centering on scientists also decenters some of the usual narratives of the history of United Fruit revealing the com a company that was internally far from monolithic and far from consistent over time in its strategies and priorities. Lancetia's program of agricultural diversification stood alongside its resistance to shifting away from the Gros Michel banana. It funded the station's long-term research program, but only in fits and starts. And just as the program began to pay off, it divested from it. Following scientists like Papineau also demonstrates the porosity of corporate science their movements and connections between government, academic, and philanthropic worlds, um, not only in national, but in transnational and trans-imperial contexts. Scientists working for corporations certainly must serve the instrumental concerns of their employers, but their ideas and activities are shaped by multiple loyalties, influences, and professional interests, which may develop in tension with competing objectives within their companies. Indeed, the history of Lancetia shows how corporate science can take on a life or multiple lives of its own. Lancetia's research program did more than simply serve the interests of United Fruit, yet neither did it offer any true alternative vision of scientific land use. The multiple visions of agricultural diversification espoused in support of the station proved difficult to reconcile. Contradictions that persist in discourses of agrodiversity and biodiversity and sustainable development today. While Lancetia became a site devoted to the science of agricultural diversity, beyond its gates, it, it succeeded best at replacing one monoculture with another. I think that's illustrated by this last satellite photo. You can see Lancetia and the reserve on one on the on the east, and you can see what's now um, nothing but um, palm oil palm plantations on, on the western side. So, with that, I will end, and I'm happy to take whatever questions you have. Thank you, Jane.